All right, if you open up to Mark chapter 10, Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 23, we'll go through verse 31. So as we ended last week, that rich young ruler, as you remember, fell into those pitfalls of understanding eternal life. And at the end, Jesus says to him, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have, give to the poor and You'll have treasure in heaven and come take up the cross and follow me. Now, what I didn't mention at the end of that message was how important land was to the Jewish believers or the Jewish people at the time. Land to these people was so intrinsically valuable for Jesus to even begin to suggest that it could be sold or done away with or given away or, or gotten rid of was absolutely outside of their box. I mean, they just don't even compute this idea to sell land, to give it away. I mean, it just so caught this guy probably by surprise. And the people that were listening probably were thinking... This isn't even possible. There's no way. We can't give away the land. Even to this day, if we wanted to try to solve the problems of the Middle East and say, well, why don't you guys just take this little piece of land over here? It's the same amount of land. It's just a different parcel of land. It's just over here. What's the problem? They won't take it. They have their land, and that is the land, and you don't get rid of it. You don't sell it. You don't no, you just, that's just not what you do. I mean, you'd be akin to like, if you made you have like a, a century farm that had been in the family for four generations and generation number five decides to sell it, grandma and grandpa are going to lose it. We just don't do that. You just don't give away the family farm that's been in the generations. You just don't do that. It's impossible. But as we think about surprises, as Jesus surprised this guy with the idea that you sell the land, you get rid of the land to follow me, I've got a funny story of a surprise for you. So in November of 1975, does anybody even remember the 70s anymore? Some, okay, never mind. Some of you do. Okay. There were 75 convicts that started digging a secret tunnel designed to bring them up into the other side of the wall of... Uh, Saltillo, Saltillo Prison in northern Mexico. On April 18th, 1976, guided by pure genius, they tunneled up into the nearby courtroom into which many of them had been sentenced. Oh. <laughs> the surprised judge returned all 75 to jail. Surprise, you know. Have you ever been caught off guard like this? You ever been caught by surprise? Jesus probably caught this guy, this rich young ruler, completely by surprise, just like inmates tunneling into a courtroom. Surprise! So now what? What do we do with this information? Jesus says, you've got to sell the family farm, which would seem impossible to these people. Like, you just don't do this. In order to follow him, now what? What am I supposed to do with this information? Maybe we, these people felt like this boy in a child, in a, in a classroom. There's an interesting cartoon that shows a fourth grade boy standing toe to toe and nose to nose with his teacher. Behind them stares a blackboard covered with math problems the boy hasn't finished. With rare perception, the boy says, I'm not an underachiever, you're an overexpector. <laughs> is that what Jesus is doing? Is Jesus just simply an over-expector? Is he expecting us to do impossible things? Is he expecting us to somehow do what's absolutely impossible? So as we read this next passage, which is basically part two of this same story, God wants you to consider the cost of gaining eternal life. God wants you to consider the cost of gaining eternal life. There's three issues that we need to consider 
as we think about the cost of gaining eternal life. As we read through this passage, let's see if you can figure out what these three issues are. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard is it for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, Well, who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. Then Peter began to say to him, See, we have left all and followed you. So Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, the last first. Three issues to consider as we think about the cost of gaining eternal life. The first issue, verses 23 through 25, we need to consider Jesus' story. Jesus is going to tell us a story, verses 23 through 25. We need to consider it. Second issue to consider, verses 26 and 27, we need to consider Jesus' statement because he says something pretty amazing. Then finally, the third issue to consider as we think about the cost of gaining eternal life, verses 28 through 31, we need to consider Jesus' strategy. He's got a strategy that he expects us to follow. All of us, not some of us, not a couple of us, not for the elite or the privileged, but all of us. So imagine you're sitting there, you're, you're listening to what Jesus just got done telling this rich young ruler. Sell the family farm and come and follow me. I suspect that the disciples and anybody else hearing this were absolutely just caught off guard. So surprised, so shocked, so just out of their mind. Like they just can't even believe what Jesus said. You ever have somebody that's just got a mouth and they just keep running it and you just kind of want to go, just go sit down, stop talking. You know, you're not helping. <laughs> I'm sure none of you know anybody like that. But I wonder if maybe the disciples were feeling like that at one point. Jesus, you can't just tell people this stuff. You're going to make this harder for us to try to... You want us to go around and tell people your message, and this is what you want us to tell people? They're going to kill us. We can't do this. Jesus, what's going on here? And so Jesus looked around and said to the disciples, because I suspect that he probably understood what they were feeling, because at other points in the gospel it says, Jesus understanding their thoughts. So I'm going to suspect that he can still understand their thoughts. He looked around and said to his disciples, how hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? So he's going to tell them the story. He's going to tell them something. How hard is it for those who have riches to enter into the kingdom of God? Now, that's maybe a bit of a rhetorical question, but let's think about it for just a second. How hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? What do you suspect that his answer should be? Nearly impossible. Why? Because we want to trust in our riches. We take pride in our riches. We take a lot of comfort in our riches. We want to use our riches for our betterment. And we think that as long as we have riches, everything's going to be okay. God has blessed me in this life because of my riches. That's how you know that God has been blessing me. Because if he wasn't blessing me, I wouldn't have all these riches. So that must clearly be a sign of God's blessing in my life or all of these riches. And we have taking comfort in these riches. And I'm not going to give these riches away. Do you know how much money this family farm is worth? I could never give this away. I'll get ostracized. They'll never accept me back. I could never go back if I give away the family farm. How hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? Sometimes the more we have, the less likely we are to trust God. 
because we're more likely to trust our riches. I've got a great job, and so therefore I don't need God. I've got a nice new house. I don't need God anymore. Look at all this wonderful possessions that I have. I don't need God anymore. It's very tough. And his disciples were astonished at his words. They just couldn't believe it. In utter shock, they were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, I suspect because he continues to know their thoughts, he knows that he's pushing buttons on them that they didn't even know they had. So Jesus is going to continue with his story here. Children, as if to say, you guys, children, how hard is it for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God? And here's the story. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, as you read commentaries, as you try to study this, these people out there that are much smarter than any of us, of course, obviously, they want to try to make this say and sound a million different ways. That it's not actually a camel, that if you translate it differently, that the Greek word is one letter away from this, or it's supposed to be something else. Because obviously, Jesus would never use such a wild illustration Jesus would never say anything controversial. Jesus would never do anything that sounded off base like this, would he? What's the answer? Of course he would. Jesus said some wild stuff in his time. He said these, this, remember in chapter 5, sending the, the, the spirits into the pigs? Who would have thought of that? At another time, he gets a whip and flips tables over. And I suspect if you thought long and hard enough about it, you could probably come up with your own things that where Jesus did some really weird stuff. He says weird things all the time. Things that catch us off guard. We don't expect Jesus to say things like this. We don't expect him to act like this. We don't expect him to respond like this. We like the idea of Jesus who just kind of sits down and just kind of loves on us and just kind of our, you know, our, our grandfather in heaven, you know, and he just, Jesus says some wild stuff, guys. He says some wild stuff. As we consider the cost of gaining eternal life, Sometimes that cost is very real financially to us. Because what if accepting Christ meant that you lost your job? Would you still follow Jesus? Which is more important to you, your, your big fancy job or Jesus? It's got a little bit more real now. What if by sharing the gospel you lost your job? I don't know if I'm going to share Jesus anymore. He's not that important. I, I need my job. I don't need to share Jesus. I know he commanded me to do it, but I really need my job. Don't you understand? Consider the cost of eternal life. What is more important to you? Jesus? Or something else? Yeah, but I got... All this stuff that I like to do. I like to, I like to spend money on this, and I like to go there, and I like to have money for that, and this, and the other thing. And while that's great, what is more important to you? Jesus or something else? We need to consider Jesus' story. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. It is not just tough, but impossible. You, on your own, doing your thing, whatever it is you think that thing is, you will never have or gain eternal life on your own. There's nothing you can do to ever gain eternal life, contrary to what so many people out there want you to believe, that if you just send in your $1,000 seed money, you ever heard that one before? If you just follow these 10 simple rules, if you just come to church, if mom and dad were believers, you're set. Come up here and get baptized real quick. We'll take care of you. 
That's not how this works. Maybe if you give enough money, we'll, we'll name a room in this church after you and you're set then. Is that how this works? That's not how this works. That's not how this has ever worked. But a lot of people want to trust in their riches. They want to trust in their own good works. They want to trust in what they have. They want to trust in other things. They want to trust in what they can do or what they have done or what they want to do. They trust in their good intentions. They trust in their good deeds or what they perceive to be good deeds. And Jesus says that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than to accomplish the things that you think you're trying to accomplish. And what do we know about a camel going through the eye of a needle? It is impossible. As you consider the cost of gaining eternal life, it's probably going to cost you something. It might cost you your riches. Jesus just got done telling this rich young ruler to sell the family farm, take up his cross and follow him, and then we'll talk about it. Did he do that? Doesn't look like it. You're telling me Jesus wasn't 100% in his evangelism? Yeah. Yeah. Not even Jesus was 100%, huh? Gives me a little bit of comfort. Not everybody I talk to is going to accept Jesus. Even the people that Jesus talked to, not 100% of them accepted him. <laughs> so it's okay. We're not called to do that. We're just called to sow the seeds. Amen? Amen. Amen just called to sow the seeds. We leave the results with God. So we need to consider Jesus' story. That on this planet, on this earth, it is impossible. And it probably will cost you something. And if you're a persistent note taker, I would urge you to write in your notes, what has following Jesus cost you? What has Jesus cost you as you followed him? Has it cost you a job? I know people that have lost their jobs as a result of their evangelism at their workplace. Has it cost you money? Has it cost you time? How many of you like to be sleeping in bed right now? But here we are. Following Jesus costs you stuff. Maybe it'll cost you a lunch because you want to share Jesus with somebody, so you take them out for dinner sometime, and you buy them dinner. But following Jesus is going to cost you something. To think that you can live in a bubble, in your bedroom, under your blankets, and think that you're going to have a successful Christian life, I'm not so sure that's how that works. Have you considered the cost of gaining eternal life. It's impossible for us. We're going to continue. Verse 26. Not only do we need to consider Jesus' story and how it's impossible for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, and he's literally talking about camels and needles' eyes. We also need to consider Jesus' statement. Verse 26. And they were greatly astonished. Now, one of the reasons that I believe that he's literally talking about a camel and the eye of a needle, and those of you that sew understand that that eye, you can't even put thread in that thing. And you want to put a camel through there? It's not just a variant on a different spelling of something else or any of the other hoops that these commentators like to jump through. Jesus was literally talking about a camel and a needle's eye. How do I think? Why do I think that? Because the very next verse says they were greatly astonished. If it was just a misspelling of a word, would they be as astonished? Probably not. They were astonished because he was talking about a camel in a needle's eye. They were greatly astonished and saying among themselves, well, who then can be saved? Another rhetorical question that we need to consider the answer to in all genuineness. Who then can be saved? And what does saved even mean, my good Theologians, what does saved mean? Set apart. To be set apart, you've been redeemed. You've called on the name of the Lord. You've accepted Christ as your Savior. If you're somebody who's been born again, then the Bible says that you are saved. It's a word we don't use too much, is it? 
I love the word saved. When were you saved? When did you get saved? Tell me about when you got saved. The apostles use it. And if it's good enough for them, by golly, it's good enough for me. Who then can be saved? In fact, in Romans 5 verse 8, talks about being saved. And why we use the word saved is because we're going to be saved from the wrath that is to come. That's the whole point of this whole thing anyway. Because if you die in your sins, you're going to hell. We all understand that. I would like to be saved from that, rescued from that. The Greek word is soteria, and it has a lot of different meanings. To be saved, rescued, helped, delivered. That's the idea. You've been rescued from the penalty of your sins now that you are saved. That's kind of the idea. Well, who then can be saved? Who can be delivered from their sins? If it is impossible for us to do, because you can't get a camel through a needle's eye, if it's impossible for us to do, who's going to be saved? They're asking seriously, who then can be saved? Jesus, who's going to be saved? If it's that impossible, who's going to be saved? Is it you? Is it me? Who can be saved? <clears throat> Jesus looked at them, probably in astonishment himself, for as astonished as they were for what he said, he is now just as astonished at what they said. Why? Because I don't understand the power of God. With men, it is impossible. True. Amen. It is impossible with us. You cannot save yourself. But with God, all things are possible. It's not your doing that gets you saved. It's nothing that you could ever do that gets you saved or born again. There's nothing that you can do because it's impossible for a camel to go through a needle's eye. But with God, all things are possible. And one of the things I learned from watching Dr. Phil, you ever watch Dr. Phil? Yeah. Sometimes. I like Dr. Phil. <clears throat> one of the things that he said, never use the word but. What's that got to do with anything? Anytime you use the word but, you can forget about everything you said before the word but. Because <clears throat> it just doesn't matter. You have negated everything that you've said because of the word but. And Jesus says but here. With, all, with men it is impossible. You know, because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's impossible with men or not. It doesn't make any bit of difference. Why? Because it's up to God anyway. It has nothing to do with you. With God, all things are possible. We need to consider Jesus' statement. With God, all things are possible. As we think about the cost of gaining eternal life, we have to recognize that it's nothing that we can do. There's nothing that you can do to earn or merit or somehow gain as a result of the things that you do or because of who you are or what you've done or your pedigree, or anything. Because with us, it's impossible. With, with God, all things are possible. Anybody could be saved if God wanted to save them. Even the worst sinner in history could be saved if God reached into history, plucked them out, and saved them. God could do that. God could do that with you. God could reach into history right now and save you if he wanted to. Maybe at some point in history, in the course of your life, God reached in and saved you. And I trust that that has happened for you. I trust that at some point in your life, you have repented of your sins and trusted in the finished work of Christ on the cross. And that God has genuinely saved you. And you now take this Christianity seriously. Because Jesus takes you seriously. Jesus took going to the cross seriously. Jesus took coming down from heaven seriously. 
Jesus takes your prayers seriously. And we need to take Christianity and following Christ just as seriously. Because with God, all things are possible. He can even save wretched sinners. Even when it's impossible to do so, God can do the impossible. And I trust as you think back in the course of your life, you think about the ways that God has answered prayer and you've seen things in your life and you thought to yourself, it would be impossible for that to happen. And the next thing you know, it happened. Because God can do the impossible. And it's amazing. And then finally, we need to consider Jesus' strategy. Verse 20, and then Peter began to say to him, boy, don't you just love Peter? Anytime something's going real climactic like and, you know, things are going somewhere, Jesus is telling stories and Jesus is getting all hot and heavy with certain things and telling these wild things. Next thing you know, it's Peter that jumps up. It's Peter that says, I'll walk on the water. It's Peter that says, we've left all to follow you. Don't you see we've done that? Don't you see we did exactly what you wanted us to do? Don't you see that we did this? Of course, it's Peter that stands up and does that. Don't you just love Peter? He says, see, we've left all and followed you. What, is he looking for the rubber stamp of approval too? <laughs> so Jesus answered and said, assuredly, I say to you. Now he's going to tell us something really important here. There is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters, and he goes through this long list, our sisters or fathers or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers, children and lands with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. He says, guys, there is nothing that if you left it behind that God could not repay you back and so many more if you would just follow me. If you would just trust me. If you would just do what I ask you to do. If you would just be obedient to me. I can fully take care of you. All the things that you thought were lost, I could give to you back and so much more. But do you trust me? Who does that make you think of? Everybody say Job. Job lost everything at the beginning of that book. Everything, gone, wiped away, clean slate for that poor guy. And in the end, he died lonely and miserable. No, that's not what it says. God restored back to Job so much more than he had in the beginning. God is able, when you lose something for the cost of eternal life, when you think you've lost something and you're struggling with, oh man, now I, my, I can't go about with my friends anymore. Lord, if, you, if I'm supposed to be following after you, that means I might not be able to go out to the bars with my friends anymore. And you feel like you've lost something of who you are as a result of following after Jesus. He is able to bring to you so much more than anything you thought was loss. He is able to do that. Because with God, all things are possible. Seems like we just read that. We feel like sometimes in our humanity... That by accepting Jesus, that means I have to give up all my fun. I have to give up all my family. I have to give up all my fortune. And I just am going to be just a miserable, sad sack for the rest of my life because I accepted Jesus. Is that fair? That's not even fair. That's not how this works. But I've known people that feel that way. They don't want nothing to do with Jesus because he's going to cut all the fun out of their life. He's going to make life miserable for them. And there's no way they want anything to do with Jesus if life's going to be miserable from now on. Man, I'd rather be playing my video games. You, you, I've, got to, I've got to read the Bible. I'd much rather be on Twitter, guys. I'd much rather be on TikTok than in my Bible. I'm not going to remember that anyway. I got newsflash for you. You're not going to remember everything you saw on TikTok either. So what's the difference? 
At least you'll learn something if you read your Bible. <laughs> I mean, come on. We think we're going to be this sad sack if we follow Jesus. As we consider the cost of gaining eternal life, I'm going to argue don't really lose anything, actually. In spite of everything you think you're going to lose, I'm going to argue you don't lose anything. Why? Because of what Jesus tells us here, his strategy, that if you follow him, if you trust him, his strategy is this. The things that you think you're going to lose, you're going to gain back in so much more anyway. And you're not going to miss any of that other stuff. You're going to look back and you're probably going to be regretful that you ever did it in the first place. Probably going to be embarrassed that you used to go out and do this with your friends. That these were the jokes that you used to tell. These are the people you used to hang out with. It's okay to take up your cross. It's okay to give up your riches. It's okay to give up so many different things. Because at the end, what really matters anyway? Jesus, eternal life, salvation, following after God, trusting him. So much more important than any of the other stuff life has to offer. Let's pray.